All right, good morning. Can people hear me in the Zoom meeting? I'm not gonna start until somebody responds affirmatively. Hooray. All right. So I realized that uh, it's been a minute since I went over the answers to the quiz questions from the last few quizzes. Uh, so let's take a moment to do that uh, before we, we jump into the rest of today. So, here's some older quizzes. Uh, so quiz number eight, this was, this was from like a week and a half ago. Uh, so this was, this was Chandy Lamport. So consider a distributed system with two processes, P1 and P2. Uh, suppose that P1 initiates the snapshot algorithm. What does P1 do after recording its own state? Uh, the answer that we were looking for here was just uh, um, it sends marker messages. So it does some other stuff after that, but the important thing is that it must send the marker messages right after recording its own state. And that's to make sure that no other events happen in between it recording its own state and it sending the marker messages out. Because if, it, if they did, then uh, that could lead to problems in the recorded snapshot. So that's the answer we were looking for there. Send out marker messages. That was quiz number eight. Uh, quiz number nine, uh, what does it mean for an algorithm to be decentralized? So the way that we defined it in class uh, was we said a decentralized algorithm is just one that can have multiple initiators. So Chandy Lamport was our first example of a decentralized algorithm. Uh, some people define this differently and I actually got some different good responses to this one. Uh, so my colleague Owen Arden, for example, uh, defines decentralization as, um, as having to do with trust and having to do with the participants not trusting one another. So that's an aspect of decentralization and that's how it might be defined in some communities. Um, but for the purposes of this class, uh, uh, we're just saying decentralization means there can be more than one initiator. And we'll, we'll see that again uh, later on when we talk about Paxos. Uh, quiz 10, uh, which of these are liveness properties? Um, Somebody just shout out the answer to this one. Which, if any, of these is a liveness property? So the options are reliable delivery, FIFO delivery, causal delivery, total, to, totally ordered delivery. Yeah, so the only one of these that's a liveness property is reliable de delivery. The rest of them are safety properties. So that means they're properties that can uh, be violated in a finite execution, which means that we can write down uh, on a piece of paper easily a violation of them. Uh, reliable delivery doesn't have that property. So that one is a liveness property. Quiz 11. All right, so suppose you have a key value store that clients access by sending messages. And the question is, what would be an example of an idempotent message from a client? And what would be an example of a non-idempotent message? So recall that an idempotent message is one where it's OK uh, if the message is delivered and takes effect uh, more than once. Uh, so in this case, uh, so the example that we talked about in class, we said that uh, assigning a value to a variable, or in this case, assigning a value to a key, uh, would be idempotent. Uh, and this is assuming that there are no other messages interleaved with those idempotent messages. Um, but an example of a non-idempotent message would be an increment operation, because if that increment was only supposed to happen once and instead it happened twice, uh, then you would be in trouble. Um, so that's what we were going for there. I think we're caught up now on, on quiz responses, um, and uh, we'll have another quiz today. All right, on to today's topic. So last time we began to talk about, uh, uh, at the very end of last time, we began to talk about replication. And we kind of got into this topic of replication uh, by, uh, by observing that it's often the case that we mitigate uh, loss of something by making copies, right? So we mitigate message loss by making copies of messages. And likewise, uh, we replicate or we mitigate loss of state by making copies of state. So making copies of state, making copies of data, 
uh, in other words, replication. Uh, so just to review what we talked about at the very, ends of, very end of last time, uh, if we have a process and the process has some events on it, so this uh, goes back to what we talked about at the beginning of the class where we can think of each of those events as being a state. Uh, and whatever our state is at a certain point is determined by all the events uh, that took place up until then. Uh, and maybe we also have some uh, memory, some process local memory, like maybe this process knows that x is 5. Um, and we can replicate this thing. Along with the state. And so why would we do this? Well, the most important reason to do it is, well, now if one of these processes crashes, now we still, that fact that x is 5 isn't lost forever. So that's one reason to do replication, uh, mitigating data loss. So we can just write down some reasons to do replication. And as we talked about at the end of last time, uh, there are other important reasons to do replication. And so one of the reasons that, that, uh, that was mentioned was, uh, was scalability. So there's different aspects to this, to what I mean by scalability. But one thing I mean is dividing up the work, right? So if you're getting a lot of messages, if you're getting a lot of requests for the value of x, and you're having a hard time handling it all, it might make sense to have another machine to take some of the burden off of you. Uh, and this is especially relevant if the requests are coming uh, from different physical locations and you would like these replicas to be close to those physical locations uh, so that you can serve them more quickly. So it's likely that a machine that's physically closer for, to you is going to be able to respond faster. Um, so data locality. is a reason to do replication. You want the copies to be close to you. Um, and so that's, that's something else that we get in addition to this. So I'm going to put fault tolerance here. Uh, and then scalability. So these are all reasons to do replication. Uh, what we didn't really get to talk about at the end of last time is what are the downsides of replication? So even though replication has all these advantages, you really don't want to do it unless you need to. So, so why is that? What are, what are the reasons not to do replication? Yeah, you need to maintain consistency. So, having to keep replicas consistent is a huge problem. And this can be very complicated, uh, especially if they can crash, right? Which was the whole reason why we wanted to do replication in the first place, or one of the reasons. And it's also especially hard if they're physically far apart, uh, which was another reason why we wanted to do replication. And it's also hard to do if they're both serving requests, which was another reason why we wanted to do replication. Uh, so all of the things that make replication important and necessary uh, also make it hard to do. And another reason not to do it is just that it's expensive, right? So 
you have to buy more machines, right? Or you have to rent them from Amazon or Google uh, or Microsoft or some other cloud computing service, right? And you have to do it in advance if you want to protect your data, right? It's not like with message loss, where if you lose a message, if a message is lost, you just send it again. Uh, with data loss, if a machine fails, then you better have already had a replica up and running. You can't just go buy another machine after the first one fails, because by then it's too late. So you need to make this upfront investment in order to protect your data. And that does indeed end up being expensive. Um, so yeah, so having to keep replicas consistent, this can be very complicated. And we're going to talk about protocols for doing replication that try to address this. So um, let's go back to our favorite picture of a total order anomaly. So this picture, uh, illustrates one of the challenges with replication. So the issue here is that different events happened in different orders on two replicas. So on replica one, x gets assigned to 1 and then to 5. On replica 2, x gets assigned to 5 and then to 1. And the problem is that these two replicas then um, end up being inconsistent. Um, but I want to talk about one thing here to, to make clear what it is uh, that we want to get out of our replicated systems. So imagine for a second uh, what it would look like if we had only one replica. Uh, so let's just call it r instead of r1 and r2. So imagine we still have the two clients, but we just have one replica R. So clients are still sending the messages. So it could happen like this. Right? Or it could happen like this. So if this first situation happens, then we end up with x being 2. If the second one happens, then we end up with x being 1. So even with one replica, um, which probably shouldn't even be called a replica in this context because there's only one of it, um, it's possible that these messages are going to arrive in different orders on different runs. And there's not an obviously better choice right, out of these two runs. Right? Like, I can't look at them and say that one is correct and the other isn't. But neither of these pictures shows a total order anomaly, right? Because recall the definition of totally ordered delivery. We said if a process delivers message one and then message two, then all processes delivering both message one and message two deliver message one first. So there's no totally ordered delivery violation in either of these pictures. Uh, because there is only one process. And so whatever happens on that process just is correct. So notice that process R has a lot of control here over when to deliver messages, right? R establishes the total order by deciding when to deliver each message that it gets. Now it could establish a different order from one run to the next, but doing so has nothing to do with the totally ordered delivery property. So having the order be the same from one run to a next would be a different property. Uh, and that property is called determinism. So determinism is a property that relates multiple runs of a system to each other. So this 
when that run does this and this other run does this, this is a violation of determinism. It's not a violation of totally ordered delivery. And this is important to point out because even though totally ordered delivery is a nice property to have, it's important to be aware that it still doesn't give you determinism. So the totally ordered delivery property is a property uh, that can only be true or not true of a single run. Uh, so determinism is a property that relates multiple runs. So you can't look at a single run and say, is this system deterministic? You have to be looking at multiple runs. Uh, by the way, um, a property that relates multiple runs to each other uh, is called a hyper property. So determinism is, is an example of a hyper property. Um, this is not actually important to the class. I just think hyper property is a fun word to say. All right, so back to talking about totally ordered delivery. So when there's only one replica, notice that it establishes a total order on a given run. What we would like to do is make it so that there can be multiple replicas, but keep this nice totally ordered property. Uh, in other words, we want clients to think that they're only dealing with one replica. We want them to think that they're dealing with a system that does not have multiple replicas. Uh, so here's an informal definition of what we want. We'll say A replicated storage system is strongly consistent if clients can't tell that it is replicated. So we want it to appear to clients as though there's only one replica, even though under the hood we may have many. So it turns out that every strongly consistent replication protocol that we're going to discuss is going to work by establishing a total order on events, but they're all going to do it in different ways. Uh, so the first one we're going to talk about uh, is called uh, is, and well before we do that let's let's before we get into particular approaches for establishing this total order and, and, and implementing strong consistency. Let's first talk about some of the ways where a client might be able to tell that data has been replicated, or in other words, uh, different ways in which replicas might disagree. So, okay, so one of the most obvious bad things that can happen um, would be something like this. So let's say you have a client and you have two replicas. So the client does a write, x is 5, and then the client tries to do a read, but they're reading the other replica. And then who knows what will happen. So if our client writes to r1 that x is 5, for instance, and then she tries to read x and the read goes to some other replica that didn't know about x or didn't know about that update. Um, then that might seem odd to our client, right? Um, so this property, the, the property that's being violated here, is called read your rights. So this is called a read your rights violation. 
or read your writes anomaly. It's one of the most fundamental things you should ask of any distributed storage system. But some systems still don't provide it. Um, OK, here's another thing that could go wrong. Suppose we have, uh, this time, two clients and two replicas. And let's say we have a, a replicated bank account. So in the previous example, uh, R1 got an update. It got that update of, of x equals 5, and it never bothered to tell R2 about it. Um, but what if R1 did tell R2 about updates, but in the wrong order? So imagine if it's something like this. So if it's a bank account, and maybe client 1 um, deposits $50, And let's say R1 sends an acknowledgment. So we know that deposit went through. And then let's say that client two tries to do a withdrawal. So if they get the acknowledgment that the deposit happened, then the withdrawal should be safe, right? So it should be safe to withdraw, say, $40 at this point. Um, well, let's say that this happens. Um, so maybe they even get a response here that says, OK. But then this replica passes this information on to replica 2. But does so in the wrong order. So now replica 2 over here, assuming it started with 0, right? At this point right here, it's now overdrawn. So if client two, maybe client two is, maybe it's even the same person, but they're looking at their account from, uh, from their phone instead of their laptop. At this point, if they try to look at their balance, uh, then the response is going to be sad, right? So in addition to just being a different device used by the same person, uh, maybe this client two over here is actually some automated process that the bank runs, right? That, uh, that periodically checks to see if people are overdrawn. Um, so the deposit and the withdrawal were getting flipped around here at replica two. Now the fact that this client waited for this acknowledgement before doing the withdrawal um, means that she should be able to have some confidence, right? That her withdrawal happens after the deposit. Um, so she has that in her communication with replica one, but maybe the replicas aren't so conscientious in their communication with each other. So if the deposit and the withdrawal got flipped around here and another client happens to do this read, um, then that client will see that the account is overdrawn. Um, by the way, banks sometimes do try to reorder transactions in a way that's beneficial to them. Uh, Wells, For Wells Fargo got in trouble for it. Uh, for manipulating transaction order to maximize overdraft fees. Um, so, so anyway, what kind of an anomaly that we've seen before does this look like? Yeah, so it looks to me like it's a FIFO anomaly, right? So here's our picture of a FIFO anomaly that we saw before. So there seems to be a, a violation of FIFO uh, between replica one and replica two here. Um, so this is what we would call a violation of FIFO consistency. 
So when we're talking about replica consistency, um, uh, we can define FIFO consistency. Uh, so before we talked about uh, read your writes, um, so read your writes consistency is, is, um, is somewhat self-explanatory, um, but we can define FIFO consistency this way. We'll say writes done by a single process are seen by all processes in the order they were issued. By the way, um, in this example, it could have uh, it could have just been one client as well. Um, in that case, we would still have a violation of, of FIFO consistency, even if this client over here hadn't made this observation. Uh, but the observation over here uh, is uh, kind of illustrates why it's bad to have a violation of FIFO consistency. Okay. Here's another bad thing that could happen. Let's stick with our bank example. Let's say that client one makes a deposit of $100 and gets an ACK. Um, let's say client two comes along. Um, client two comes along, checks the balance, um, and sees that there's a hundred dollars in the account. Okay, so client two then tries to do a withdrawal. and they can't. Uh, somebody asked to see the violation, or to see the definition of, of FIFO consistency again. So here's the definition of FIFO consistency. Okay, so back here, so client two comes along, checks the balance, sees that the balance was 100, then tries to do withdrawal. Unfortunately, that withdrawal hits the other replica. So if we said that these started at zero, um, then they would try to do their withdrawal and get sad face, insufficient funds. So why did client two think that they could do a withdrawal? Well, the withdrawal is being done because of this earlier deposit. And client two found out about this earlier deposit, right? Because they did this balance uh, inquiry here. So if you follow the chain of events, um, you can see that this deposit of $100 happened before the withdrawal in the sense of happened before that we've talked about. We can walk down this chain of events here and see that this happened before this, happened before this, happened before this, happened before this, happened before the withdrawal. So you can see that the deposit of $100 happened before the withdrawal. And so client two isn't doing anything wrong. The problem is that replica two sees the withdrawal, but it doesn't see this thing that's in the causal history of the withdrawal. So in particular, Replica 2 doesn't see the deposit. So because 
Replica 2 sees this but doesn't see everything that's in its causal history, this is a violation of what we can call causal consistency. Okay, so somebody's asking, okay, why did client two, uh, why did client two read from replica two instead of replica one? Um, yeah, so, so good question. Yeah, so in a replicated storage system, you might not have control over which replica you're talking to, right? Now, what we'll see in a minute when we start to look at some protocols for replication uh, is that clients are sometimes forced to interact with a particular replica, and that's in fact how consistency is enforced. Um, but yeah, the, the, you could argue that the issue in this case was that the client talked to replica 2, and if only all clients talked to replica 1, we would have no problems. But also, if all clients only talk to replica 1, then we lose out on a lot of the benefits of replication. So that's why. Okay, so we can define causal consistency, and I'll put it on the same page as FIFO here. We'll say writes that are potentially causally related in other words related by happens before must be seen by all processes in the same order. So we've talked about several different consistency guarantees. I talked about read your rights, uh, I talked about FIFO, I talked about causal, um, and then I talked about, informally at least, I talked about strong consistency. And we said uh, our informal definition of strong consistency was that clients couldn't tell that the data was replicated at all. Uh, so we can put these different consistency guarantees in a hierarchy. Um, so read your rights consistency. is near the bottom of the hierarchy. FIFO consistency is a step up from that. Causal consistency is a step up from that. Strong consistency is a step up from that. And there are more that I could add to this picture. Many more, in fact. Uh, there was a paper that came out uh, a few years ago which discussed over 50 different notions of consistency. I promise not to make you learn about all of them. But I'm bringing this up because I want to emphasize that different systems make different consistency choices, and higher up isn't necessarily better. There are good reasons to want to pick something weaker than strong consistency. Uh, so we'll come back to that later in the course. Um, Right now, though, we're going to talk about replication strategies that enforce strong consistency, uh, which we informally defined as meaning clients can't tell that the data is replicated. So we're going to talk about a couple of replication strategies, both of which enforce strong consistency. Uh, and, um, and so let's, uh, let's jump into that. Uh, there was a request to see the definition of causal consistency again. Here you go. Uh, 
Actually, you know what? Um, I think now is a good time to do a quiz question. So let's do that. So here is today's quiz question. And I will share it. Form should be accepting responses now. Ah, so there's some good questions uh, on Twitch. So um, somebody asks about uh, um, relationship to serializability uh, in database theory. Um, yeah, so this is a great question. Um, so it's not exactly the same thing. Um, so when we talk about uh, when we talk about strong consistency, uh, we're not going to um, necessarily define this any more formally than the way that I defined it, uh, which was to say, um, uh, we say that replicas are strongly consistent if clients can't tell that the data is replicated. Uh, but um, the, the gold standard definition uh, for strong consistency is, is something called linearizability, uh, which was uh, defined by Maurice Herlihy and Jeanette Wing in the 90s. Um, linearizability is not the same thing as serializability. Uh, Peter Bayless actually has a nice blog post about this. So if you just Google for linearizability and serializability, you should be able to find his post. Um, but um, yeah, so serializability um, uh, is, a, is a different notion. Um, and it has to do with, um, uh, if I can remember correctly, um, it has to do with um, uh, ability to reorder transactions. So um, we're not talking about transactions in this case, we're talking about single operations. Uh, there are notions of consistency that do have to do uh, with transactions, um, but we're mostly concerned with non-transactional notions of consistency. So all of these transactional um, or all, all of these, all of these notions of consistency that I've talked about, so FIFO consistency, causal consistency, uh, read your rights consistency, uh, these are all considered non-transactional. All right, we'll wait a minute longer here. All right, let's move on. So we're gonna start talking about uh, ways to enforce strong consistency, uh, replication strategies that enforce strong consistency. The first one we're gonna talk about is called primary backup replication. 
So the idea is pretty straightforward. We pick a particular replica to be what's called the primary, and the other replicas are backups. So let's call the primary P, and let's say that we have two backups, V1 and V2. And the idea is that, as some of you might have, had, have anticipated, clients only interact with the primary. So when the primary gets a write from a client, It then broadcasts that write to all the backups. And they all send an ACK to the primary. At the point when all of the backups have acknowledged the write to the primary, then the primary can tell the client that the write succeeded. And this point right here, this point at which all of the backups have acknowledged the primary, we call this the commit point. So this is the point at which the write uh, can officially have been said to happen. And at that point, the primary is actually allowed to deliver the right to itself. Uh, and then we can act the client. So that's how write, writes work. What about reads? Uh, what does the client do when it wants to read the value of x? Anyone know? Or want to take a guess? Sure, okay, yeah, so if the client, somebody says, is, does the read happen after the commit point? Well, yeah, so the client doesn't know exactly when this commit point is, but if the client tries to read a value that it just wrote before it got the acknowledgement, then all bets are off, right? So if you're the client and you do a write and you haven't gotten an act of that write yet, then you should have no expectation of that write actually having taken effect. So if the client does, the, does a read up here somewhere before it, does, before it gets the act, then who knows what'll happen. Um, but let's assume that the client is, is doing the read sometime after it's gotten the act. Um, who does it do the read to? It just talks to the primary. So we can extend these lines a little bit here. Um, so it just asks the primary. So there's no need for reads to be broadcast to the other replicas and then the primary response. Or in this case, I guess it would actually return the value five. So if the client tries to read X while this whole broadcast and ACK process is still happening over here, then it, indeed it might get an old value of X, but that's okay because it's, uh, it, its right wasn't acknowledged yet. So it should have no expectation of having uh, the right having actually taken effect. So that's primary backup. Um, it's pretty simple. Writes get broadcast to backups. Backups have to act the primary before the primary acts the client. And reads just get answered by the primary. This is all a very old idea. It's been around since the 70s at least. Um, what are the drawbacks to this? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so one drawback, right, is that it's slow. The primary is a bottleneck. Remember how we said that one of the reasons to do replication is to spread the work around, right? So we listed several reasons for doing replication. Um, so fault tolerance was the number one reason. Um, and then we said data locality. Um, and then we said dividing up the work. Um, uh, so 
Does primary backup replication help with any of those things? So, Dividing up the work that uh, we could also we could also call that um, horizontal scaling. Okay, so does primary backup replication help with any of these things? Does it help with fault tolerance? Hmm. Some people are saying no. I would argue that it does help with fault tolerance, right? Because if the issue here is that a replica could crash, right? If the primary crashes, then one of these backups could take over. Um, and we know that the backups are not going to be behind, right? Because commits uh, or writes don't commit on the primary until they've already happened and been acknowledged by the backups. So you know that the backups are going to be at least as up to date as the primary. Um, so Primary backup replication does actually help uh, with fault tolerance. Does it help at all with data locality, though? No, it doesn't. Because everybody's just talking to the primary. That's right. So it doesn't help with that. The primary has to handle all the writes and reads. So we can't have a replica that's particularly close to some clients. So it doesn't help with that. And it doesn't help with dividing up the work either. Everybody has to talk to the primary. So it helps with fault tolerance. So that's something. That's great. Um, but uh, it doesn't help with these other things that were other reasons for doing replication. OK. Somebody asked in chat, uh, which backup takes over uh, when the primary dies? Well, it doesn't really matter, right? Because if the primary dies, then all you really want is for all of the rights that have been committed on the primary uh, to have not been lost, right? So any of these backups would do, right? Because we can't commit on the primary until all of the backups have acknowledged the right. Uh, so it doesn't really matter which one takes over. Um, if there is some ordering of them, then we could just say, okay, whoever's next in line. Uh, maybe if you, had a, a, if you had some more sophisticated way of knowing which one is less likely to fail, uh, then maybe you would choose that one to be the primary. Uh, but um, there's no... Uh, in the definition of primary backup uh, that we're laying out here, um, it's not that important uh, which backup takes over for the primary if somebody does have to take over. Okay, so a natural question to ask at this point is, could we do better? Um, could we spread out the work any better? Could we make it so that the primary doesn't have to do all the work? Does anybody have any suggestions on how to do that? So one suggestion in chat is uh, allow the client to talk to any server. Um, so you all are kind of uh, jumping ahead. Uh, this is something that we're going to talk about later. Um, so the, the advantage of having the client just talk to the primary, right, is that, that that challenge that we had earlier of, of trying to establish a total order of events uh, that we saw here. Um, so that challenge is being met by having the primary be in charge of the order of events. So in other words, it's like these scenarios where the clients are talking to the sim single replica and then that replica has some other um, processes back here 
that only the replica uh, or, or only the primary talks to. So clients never interact with those backups. Um, so the primary ends up being in charge of the order of events. And if you allowed clients to talk to any replica, then knowing the order of events suddenly gets a lot harder. Um, but of course, then we have the problem of the, of the primary being a bottleneck. So is there any way that we could make a small change to the way that this is happening here uh, that would help maybe spread out the work a little more? Yeah, so one suggestion already in chat is a good one. So it says, have the backups take care of reads. So instead of having reads go to the client, have the reads go over here. So if we do that, uh, we could do that, right? But we wouldn't necessarily know what we'd be reading, right? We might actually be reading data from the future, right? Because if you, if you do a, a, a read over here to this backup, um, you, that backup might have data that's actually more up to date than what's on the primary. Because when we read from the primary, we know uh, when a previous write has finished, right? Because it, it acknowledges us. Um, but with the backups, who knows what state they're in, right? Well, okay, so we could try picking out a particular backup to always read from, and then have that backup acknowledge us when the writes to the primary have finished. So let's try that. So we have our client. Okay. And we say, when we do a write, We send it here just like we did before. But what we want to do is we want to allow one of the backups to handle reads. Let's say that we're going to have the last backup handle reads. So what we'll do is we'll have the primary pass along the right to backup one here. Backup one passes it along to backup two. And backup two acknowledges the client. And then if the client wants to do a read, they can do it from here. We just invented chain replication. So this is, uh, this is actually a fairly new idea compared to primary backup replication. Um, the paper came out in 2004. And it's called chain replication for supporting high throughput and availability by uh, Van Rennes and Schneider. So we really should p be picking different names for these things, right? Because now that we don't have uh, we don't have a single node that's handling all writes and reads, I don't want to call it primary anymore. Uh, and in fact, that's not what the chain replication people call it. Um, they call this process the head process. So I'll call it H for head. Um, and they call this process here the tail. <laughs> 
So I'll call that one T for tail. And then this one, it doesn't really have a name. We'll just call it B for backup. So in chain replication, um, there could be any number of replicas, um, but we always have one that's the head and one that's the tail. Um, so we have one node that just handles writes, and that's the head. And we have one that just handles reads, and that's the tail. And then any number that's in between. And when we do a write, we send it to the head node. We pass it along to the next node in the chain. That one passes it along to the next node, and so on until we're at the tail. The tail then acknowledges the client. So we've managed to divide up the work a little better than we did before, right? We divided up the work at least into writes and reads now. OK, so somebody's asking, it's a good question. How does this allow high throughput, right? They claim, they make this claim, right? High throughput in the title of the paper. Bold claim. OK, so what do you think they mean by high throughput? What is throughput? We'll define it as number of actions per unit of time. So if we have a more or less equal mix of writes and reads, then in theory, chain replication is going to be a better choice than primary backup replication because since we have one node handling writes and one handling reads, then we can process more requests in a given amount of time, at least in theory. Um, so depending on the mix of writes and reads, chain replication might beat primary backup replication in terms of throughput. What's the downside of chain replication? Here's the picture again. Yeah, so with primary backup, when the client did a write, how long did they have to wait before getting an ACK? Let's look at the primary backup picture again here. So when the client does a write, the primary broadcasts this message out to all of the backups. Those backups acknowledge the client. And there could be any number of backups, by the way. Um, so there could be three in which case this would go out to all of them, and so on. There could be any number of backups. Uh, so the primary has to wait to get all those acknowledgments, but all of those broadcast messages go out in parallel, right? Um, so it still might be slow to have to wait for all the acknowledgments, but it scales nicely. If we add more backups, um, there's still the same amount of waiting to do on average, right? So the, the, the longest thing that we have to wait for is whichever one of these backups is slowest to respond to the primary. So there's going to be four messages, right? There's the time it takes for this message to get to the primary. There's the time that it takes for the slowest one of these to get to one of the backups. And this, then there's the time it takes for the slowest one of the X to get back to the primary. And then there's this response here. Um, so it's four messages. And if we added more backups, that number would still be four, um, because the primary contacts every backup in parallel. So it's a constant number four. Constants are great. But how long does it take to get an acknowledgment of a write when you're doing chain replication? Well, here we had three. We had the head, the middle one, and the tail. So this took one message, this took one message, this took one message, and this took one message. So here it's four. But if I made this chain longer, then that number would also get bigger, right? So it depends on the length of the chain. Yeah. So chain replication has worse write latency. So we'll define latency as time between 
invocation and completion of a single action. What about read latency? Is that going to be any different for primary backup and chain replication? So here's what it looks like for chain replication. Reads go to the tail. The tail responds to the client. For primary backup, reads go to the primary and then the primary response to the client. Is that going to be any different in terms of latency? It shouldn't be, right. That just takes two messages in either case. Okay. So chain replication could give us better throughput in certain cases, depending on the mix of writes and reads in your application. Um, but it's worse in terms, of, in terms of write latency, depending on the number of, uh, of uh, nodes that there are in the chain. Um, in terms of read latency, it's the same either way. Okay, so chain replication, primary backup replication uh, have different advantages and disadvantages. Um, and they're both pretty commonly used. So um, one reason to want to do chain replication, right, uh, is this throughput argument. Um, but one thing that you have to keep in mind there is that writes and reads uh, don't take the same amount of time. So writes are more expensive than reads. So if you have, let's say, an equal amount of reads and writes in your application, um, then, and if you had a, had a chain replication, then this head node is still going to get slammed, right? Because it, let's say writes um, are... Um, let's say writes take about four times as long as reads, um, then, then this process is still going to have a lot more work to do than this process um, in terms of responding to the client. Um, now, if you had a different mix, if you had a lot more reads than writes, uh, then it might actually make sense. And so next time we'll look at some figures from the chain replication paper that help illustrate uh, under what circumstances it makes sense to do chain replication. All right, we're out of time for today. See you next time.